At the foothills of the Himalayas, in the tiny mountain kingdom of Nepal, a tragedy the size of Everest has confounded the gods. Despite a profound faith in the power of the deities, evil has found its way into this land. One night of mayhem in Nepal's royal palace has shattered ancient beliefs and left a people reeling and confused. Now, members of the royal household speak for the first time to reveal what really happened the night a crown prince murdered his father, the king, and all but wiped out a dynasty. After he made sure the king was dead by pushing his body with his feet, and then he turned round and shot, well, everybody in sight, it seemed to me. He says, brother, nai dai, nai dai, which in the body he said, nai dai, nai dai, no brother, no brother. With a revered king dead, a new king has been crowned. But there's a crisis of faith in the monarchy. This is a period that's probably about as excruciating as it could get for any country in the world. And uh, this little kingdom in the Himalaya really got it between the eyes. The massacre of the royal family has given new life to a mass movement based on the teachings of Chairman Mao. A people's war is underway, and it threatens to topple the government of Nepal. It's the festival of Gai Jatra and the people of Kathmandu gather to honour their dead. This is a centuries-old ritual, started by a king to cheer up his queen, grieving over the death of a son. So this year's festival has a special resonance. Nepalis have lost their beloved king, King Birendra, the monarch revered here as an incarnation of the god, Vishnu, the protector. Losing the king is catastrophe enough. Losing an entire royal family at the hand of the crown prince, who then killed himself, has been cataclysmic. We all grew up together. We went to school in the same place. And they were my family. And now there's hardly a handful of us left. I mean, it's the biggest tragedy I've ever suffered in my life. You know, I, I, I hate to recollect even uh, the things that I saw there. I mean, it, it, it was something terrible. I mean, uh, I mean, let no one should go through such a, such a thing in his life. Since then, I saw that uh, what is a man's life? It is so short, you see. These witnesses to the massacre all knew the Crown Prince, Dipendra, from birth. The heir to the throne held senior rank in the Royal Nepal Army. It was well known Dipendra had a fascination for guns, but no one knew how deadly that might become. On Friday night, June the 1st, as Kathmandu went about its business, a regular gathering of the royal inner circle was starting at the palace. But tonight was different. After greeting guests, the Crown Prince retired to his room, pretending to be drunk. Half an hour later, he emerged dressed in combat fatigues and armed to the teeth. Princess Ketiki Rajya Lakshmi Devi Shah is a prominent figure in the royal family, a cousin and lifelong friend of the late King Birendra. She was the first to see the Crown Prince. Just before the incident, I was standing in what they call the billiard room, where it all took place. I'm now standing almost in front of the door with my sister, Princess Jayanti, who eventually died in the incident. And I just saw him walk in, in full uniform, with boots and gloves, and I thought he looked a little bit comical, really. 
and I commented to my sister saying, oh, isn't he getting a bit old for fancy dress? I heard somebody coming, footsteps. I just out of curiosity looked back over my shoulder. Mahesh Singh was the next to see the Crown Prince. He was talking to King Virendra as the Prince approached. I hear bang, bang, two shots. They're so close to my right ear that I thought I completely blew my ear drum. Ravi Rana was by the King's side and he looked the Prince in the face. Then I uh, didn't say anything, but I said that, why? I said, uh, by gesture, I said, why? And he saw my face. He saw my face. It was not angry at all. The Crown Prince then produced a machine gun. When I close my eyes, I hear the automatic fire. The first part, it went like that. Who was shot? I didn't see. Then suddenly, I had my gaze towards his master. Then I suddenly find his master was lurching on the right side, was leaning like this. Quiet after all that, I mean, I think he finished off the whole magazine and I heard King Virendra say rather quietly in Nepali, what are you doing? And he was, from where I was standing, he was behind a pot plant, so I just went forward to see what was happening and I saw, I noticed he had been shot and I saw him start to fall. And that's when I realized that, I mean, he's been shooting the king. And I, I was totally dazed. I mean, I didn't know how to react. The Crown Prince left the billiard room, but returned again, this time armed with a new automatic weapon. Prostate covered my head. My As Mahesh arms, Singh took cover, like the Crown Prince's cousin, Prince Paris, tried to intervene. He says, brother, nai dai, nai dai, which in the Pali he said, nai dai, nai dai. No brother, no brother. No brother, three, two, three times he said. By now, the crown prince was bent on utter destruction. And, well, he shot at the king's party again, and, and he even went up, I mean, I think by then the king was dead because he, he sort of kicked the body with his feet to make sure he wasn't moving. And then he just swung the gun around and he shot all of us. And as I was lying there, I mean, I saw one of my cousins, I mean, he deliberately took aim and just shot off the back of her head. And then he swung the gun around and there were two of, I mean, I didn't recognize who it was at the time, but there were two, two cousins, ladies on the ground and he so casually just swung the gun around and shot at them again. In the space of two minutes, the Crown Prince had killed 10 members of the royal household. Five others were wounded and taken to hospital. Princess Ketiki saw her sister machine gunned to death. The princess took fire to her shoulder. I was lying on the marble floor and I could hear the blood flowing out of my shoulder. And that's when I looked down and saw my shoulder and I saw, well, white stuff, which I suppose was bone. I didn't look any further, I just uh, wrapped my sari around it and tried to hold it together as best I could and stop the bleeding. It was a bloody, it was a bloody, it was a bloody scene. So many blood all over the places. Well, I know it's, it's so sad. Um, a moment ago we were talking and suddenly they are not there. As word of the tragedy spread beyond the palace, the nation struggled to comprehend. It emerged that the Crown Prince had fallen for a forbidden love, Devyani Rana, a commoner with Indian blood. The Prince could marry her, but there was a cost he could never be king. A palace insider confirms this. He couldn't marry the girl of his choice, 
uh, that happened. Uh, that is the only reason. Major General Bharat Simha has served the palace for much of his life. He is the honorary aide de camp to the king and once served as the Crown Prince's guardian. Well, I mean, you can blame anyone. Everyone. You can blame everyone. You can blame the king and the queen saying that you know, they didn't let him marry. You can blame the uh, family saying that you know, they didn't stop. But, but you know, this is hypothetical. With the bodies of the royal family set alight, with them died any way of knowing exactly what motivated the crown prince to not just kill his father, but annihilate his entire family. It was the start of the country's plunge into a dangerous confusion. The palace put the killings down to an accidental firing of a machine gun, an explanation no one believed. Then there was a hasty inquiry. It produced the weapons used by the Crown Prince, but it failed to examine anyone on oath. Now, few are prepared to accept the simple truth that the Crown Prince pulled the trigger. Even those who were there are left wondering. He is the man. I know very well. I know that he is the man. Still, still I don't believe. There are, some doubt comes in my mind. No human being could have done that. It is just the providence. It is the hand of God. Is it possible he just went crazy? Could be that. Could be that also. Because, uh, as you know, in the report, you see, he was smoking something, black something or something. And people tell me that uh, in your part of the world, you have uh, some sort of uh, this uh, drugs which, you know, which if you take it, that you don't see people. You see tigers and you see leopards and you see lions. So when you shoot them, you're not shooting people. You're shooting uh, animals which are going to devour you. It might seem laughable, but the confusion over who did pull the trigger and why is genuine, and it's having a profound impact. In the villages and towns of Nepal, the confusion over the palace massacre is feeding a growing Maoist revolution. Long abandoned in China, Mao's philosophies can still draw a sizeable crowd, here at Kirtipur on the outskirts of Kathmandu. Dilip Maiharjan is one of the leaders of this people's uprising. He explains the palace massacre with the party's official conspiracy theory, a theory implicating Nepal's former Prime Minister, Girija Korela. Under this theory, the late king had refused to mobilise the nation's army to suppress the Maoists, and paid for that with his life. The Maoist line may even be a deliberate distortion, but it's falling on fertile soil amongst Nepal's poor and dispossessed. Hundreds of thousands of small farmers perform backbreaking work for a pittance each day. For Dilip Maiharjan, they are ideal recruits for a peasant revolution.
Dilip and his wife share this house with their three children. He's already spent 40 days in jail as a political prisoner. But this humble farmer's time apparently has come. <laughs> the royal massacre has changed the political dynamic. Two years ago, the Maoists had established a foothold in the west of Nepal, in the poorest districts of the country. At the time, it was a small underground operation. As the Maoists gathered recruits, they also killed and maimed police in random attacks. Casualties then were few. But two years on, the movement has exploded. Just weeks ago, Maoist leaders invited cameras along for a show of their strength. They're well drilled, they've got guns, and they don't mind using them. In this undeclared civil war, the Maoists have killed over 400 police. In return, police have killed more than a thousand Maoists. This was a country where a political death used to bring the country to a halt. It was, it would send shock waves through the country. Kanek Dixit is Nepal's leading political commentator. He's watched the fast tracking of the Maoist revolution under the leadership of a shadowy figure known only as Comrade Prachanda. What Mr. Prachanda and his colleagues have decided to do is take a shortcut using the gun. And lo and below, behold, it has worked thus far in their favour. And it seems the Maoist leader is elusive even to the man who's meant to be running the country, Prime Minister Dolba. Have you been negotiating or talking directly with Comrade Prachanda? No. There's a reliable link, link person. Between Maoist and me. That only that, that, that I can tell you right now. The Prime Minister was thrust into the job two months ago after his predecessor failed to deal effectively with the Maoists. Now the revolution is at the gate. As we interviewed the Prime Minister, barely 10 minutes away, in Kathmandu's central Durba Square, the Maoists were rallying. Their number one demand is an end to Nepal's constitutional monarchy, now. I, I can't force them to change their convictions, but the Russian monarchy will remain here forever. If the Maoists, though, insist... No. Constitutional monarchy is multi-party democracy. No compromise against constitutional monarchy. No compromise against multi-party democracy. They know this fact. Multi-party democracy has only been in Nepal for 10 years. Yet in that time, there's been 10 different governments and six different prime ministers. As well, corruption has become rampant. So it's little wonder that so many people appear to be drawn to the Maoist alternative. Yes, I must be honest uh, to say that we couldn't address the problem of the countries after democracy. We could not address the problem of poverty. We could not address the problem of social injustice, caste systems, like untouchability. We couldn't address 
problem of unemployment. We could address the problem of backward ethnic communities. And Maoist came into picture and selling the dream. The Prime Minister is desperate to buy time. The palace killings have unhinged the national psyche. Until the death of the old king, Virendra, the monarchy was the one spiritual thread which bound Nepalis together. But for many, that thread has snapped. The only man who can put it back together again is the new king, Ganendra, here on a rare public outing to pay homage to his mother. But few are convinced there's much that's godly about Ganendra. Before his coronation, he'd used his royal position to build a thriving business empire. The present king of Nepal, Ganendra, has a problem with uh, some amount of credibility with his populace. He comes under a cloud onto the throne because there's a lot of suspicion that he himself might have been involved in it. The new king, too, is the victim of yet another conspiracy theory that he plotted with his son, Prince Paris, to kill the old king and seize power. Prince Paris is the playboy prince, whose high living ways have badly damaged the royal image. Leaving a party, he was drunk, driving too fast, and killed a young musician in the streets of Kathmandu. But the prince was never prosecuted. So, in the period when there was no information coming out, in this completely period of mayhem that we underwent, it was very easy for people to jump to the conclusion that this must be cons a conspiracy, where Paras, who already known as a bad character, might have had a, a role to play. Amidst the growing uncertainty, the government has called on the Maoists to halt the violence, to give the parties time to negotiate. The Maoists, for their part, are daring the government to bring it on. A challenge to civil war, which is galvanising Nepal's political leaders. What happens if negotiation fails? What happens if it cannot be solved through the political process? What then? It will be terrible. Terrible. It means civil war that will be very unfortunate for the nation. In that case, the nation will lose. In that case, no one, no people will gain. Isn't the next logical step, if negotiation fails, a violent uprising? <coughs> Why should negotiate, negotiation fail? I'm hopeful that negotiation will going to succeed. This is the palace's offering to the people, a choral rendering of a special verse penned to commemorate the deaths of the royal family. Yet it seems oddly out of tune with life outside the palace walls today. And with the nation's protector, King Birendra, gone, there now seems little to stop the old order being swept away. I've known four kings now. It seems to me, at the present moment, the Nepalese haven't been able to handle a democratic Nepal. They feel exploited, probably by the politicians, probably by the monarchy, but I've never seen Nepal this low, or the Nepalese people this low. You know, my life.